Yeah, so today we are uh, visited by Professor Khaled Beydoun. Uh, professor Khaled Beydoun is a law professor, author, and public intellectual. Uh, he is the author of the critically acclaimed book, American Islamophobia, Understanding the Roots and Rise of Fear. Um, and he's also co-editor of Islamophobia and the Law, as well as uh, author of his new book, uh, The New Crusades, Islamophobia and the Global War on Muslims. This is what you will be talking about today. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, without any further ado, please. Yep. No, thank good. you so much for, for having me. Thank you, Hussein, for facilitating this event. Thank you to Muslim Aid of Sweden for bringing me here to Sweden all the way from the United States. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I teach law at Wayne State University uh, School of Law. Uh, last year, I was a visiting professor at the Harvard University Berkman uh, and Klein Center where I spent a lot of time thinking about the intersection of law and technology, specifically within the realm of surveillance, which converges really closely with Islamophobia in a range of ways. So I'll address that convergence. I'll address Islamophobia from a theoretical standpoint. So my, my, my talk isn't gonna center specifically on this new book. And this new book, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly, addresses Islamophobia as a global phenomenon, again, as a phenomenon that's essentially been advanced and peddled uh, by my government, the American government, uh, for the last 22 years now, right? The War on Terror uh, is a two decades long project uh, that began in the very sort of like halls of power of the American state, but then was exported on a transnational level in ways that have made uh, metastasized Islamophobia in a range of distinct campaigns and crusades around the world, which is why I titled the book, uh, The New Crusades, uh, you know, tied obviously to the to the classical religiously fueled crusades, which ripped across Europe many centuries ago. Uh, but President George Bush, the first uh, president who was the spearhead of the American War on Terror, um, also called the War on Terror a crusade as well. Uh, you know, hearkening the memory and the image that Islam, as a religion and as a rival political civilization, uh, was inimical and threatening to the West, and specifically the West being conflated with Christianity. So I'm happy to be here because I'm an academic. Many people don't know that I'm an academic and a law professor, but um, it is really settings like this one where I truly feel at home to be able to discuss issues uh, like Islamophobia um, in, a, in a very nuanced, detailed, but also rigorous way. So I'm excited to have that conversation with all of you. I'm going to use my PowerPoint as sort of a springboard, right, to discuss many topics, but uh, I'm no, by no means am I bound to the conversation that I'd like to have to this PowerPoint. So I'm going to speak for roughly 30 to 40 minutes, but I'm really intrigued and I'm really excited to have a conversation, which I, which I hope will be dynamic with all of you about this topic, uh, other topics. You know, obviously I'm not Swedish, so you know a lot more than I do about Islamophobia and issues around religious and racial bigotry here in the country of Sweden. So I'm really keen to learn about your insights. Uh, one quick note, I'm also a critical race theorist, right? So and some of you may know that critical race theory in recent time, uh, specifically in my country, the United States, but also on a global level has been demonized and vilified in, in a range of ways. To my memory, I'm the first um, Muslim American uh, to engage in research within the realm of critical race theory in the law. And my intention as an academic uh, very early on um, was to find a space within the canon in the discipline of critical race theory, which when I was in law school, I went to UCLA uh, for, for law school, and UCLA is home in many respects to the most uh, you know, formative and pioneering critical race theorists. Um, a lot of the discussion on critical race theory two decades ago when I entered law school fixated on the experience of African Americans, Latino Americans, indigenous Americans, um, and because I was in law school at the time of the post 9-11 context, it became sort of my immediate mandate and charge to fill that intellectual void to discuss the experiences of Muslim Americans as they unfolded in, in real time. So I've written a series of books, right? So this is my third book now on Islamophobia as a, a, a general topic. My first uh, public book addressed Islamophobia uh, as tied to the American experience, right? So how Islamophobia was being advanced by specifically the national security state in the United States in the consequence of the 9-11 terror attacks, right? We saw transformative changes legally, politically, with regard to the architecture uh, of state power in the post 9-11 context, as the American uh, government on a domestic level looked to push forward 
this war on terror, and then obviously it percolated, uh, advanced and expanded on a global level in, in the years afterwards. My second book is a reader uh, in conjunction with another law professor, a friend of mine, Syra Chowdhury, who teaches law in Florida, where we constructed a compendium of many of the leading and foundational uh, academic articles addressing Islamophobia in very various areas of law. So immigration law, employment law, gender in the law, employment law, corporate law, uh, international uh, law, comparative law. Uh, that reader is, uh, you know, is for, the, the audience for that reader are people like you guys, academics, students, researchers. For my first and third book, uh, this new book, like the first, is very much intended for a general audience, right? My objective with the first and third book uh, is dramatically different than the second. The second is, again, more geared towards injecting discussion of Islamophobia in the law within the academic literatures. The first and the third is to try to like shift and change the hearts and minds of real people, right? Lay people, individuals that sadly don't have the privilege and the opportunity to enter elite spaces like this one, right? So um, uh, both, both kinds of projects are dear to my heart. I enjoy writing both, but part of me likes to be kind of on the grassroots uh, and write for the people, and I'll talk about that more briefly uh, in the discussion. So in, in, in addition to the, ra the, the three books that I've written, uh, I've also published uh, academic articles uh, specifically within uh, the legal uh, literatures, legal journals. My, my areas of academic research center on constitutional law, specifically in the United States, we have something called the First Amendment, right? The First Amendment uh, enshrines a range of rights. There's five rights associated with the First Amendment in the United States, kind of modeled after many European chapters, right? The two clauses that really uh, are germane to my research are freedom of religion, right, and the state's relationship with religion, right? In the states, we call that the Establishment Clause, this whole notion of separation of church and state, right? Which we know becomes murky in the post-9-11 context because uh, various presidential administrations in the United States kind of have this, you know, very dangerous and oftentimes intimate dance where they endorse Christianity and part of separation of church and state from American jurisprudence is you can't castigate and condemn religion as well, right? Condem condemnations, castigations, of the religion of Islam, of Muslims also, treads on possible encroachment of the First Amendment Establishment Clause. And obviously we all, you know, law students in the room, those who study law, know that there's considerable overlap with uh, the religion clauses, free exercise of religion, Establishment Clause, with other rights, right? Freedom of speech, uh, the freedom to assemble peaceably, freedom of conscience, right? They're distinct clauses according to my constitution, but again, the convergence is very dynamic and oftentimes very considerable. So I've written in that area. I, I write a lot about surveillance also, right? Policing and surveillance. And obviously now we're shifting into this really dystopian postmodern context where surveillance is becoming digital, right? So it's not only the state engaging in surveillance, we all have these, where'd it go? These cell phones, right? Where now surveillance is an entirely different animal where instead of states engaging in policing and surveillance of individuals like you and I, it's private corporations, big tech, Meta, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, so on and so forth, right? And oftentimes they're more clever. I move a lot, I'm sorry. So I may, there might be a time where I get up and walk around. But again, I have a cold and my nose is kind of bleeding, so I don't want to get blood on you guys. You know, I, don't want, I don't want you guys to go tell your friends this American professor came and bled on me, right? <laughs> so I'll try to isolate myself to this little spot. So surveillance again, obviously surveillance ties really closely with Islamophobia because that is one focal primary way in which the state cracks down on the religious rights of not only Muslims, but racial and religious minorities of all sorts. Um, and I spent last year again teaching and researching at Harvard where I was really interested in this intersection between education and technology, but also looking at the positives of technology as well, thinking about ways in which technology can be a facilitator of education, specifically for marginalized groups, right? Com uh, groups that, again, don't have the economic uh, opportunity or the practical privilege to attend elite universities. Technology, in some respects, can be uh, an equalizer. So before I jump into a legal definition uh, of Islamophobia, um, which motivated much of my earlier work on theorizing Islamophobia roughly, um, damn, we're 2023 now, so, I would say a decade ago was when I began to think critically about um, a very cogent, detailed, nuanced framework for how to think about Islamophobia 
and I'll discuss that in a bit. Um, but it's 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 incumbent upon me and all of us who are really interested in this area to preface our discussion of uh, this work on Islamophobia as an intellectual project with Orientalism, right? And we all know that Edward Said, uh, iconic Palestinian intellectual, crafted this master discourse of, uh, of, of Orientalism in his magnum opus, this book that he wrote in 1979 by that same title, Orientalism, crafted this theory that the West, right? Uh, and by West, I mean that as capaciously as you can think, Western governments, Western artists, Western media outlets, Western tastemakers, Western novelists, Western um, filmmakers, uh, Western tastemakers, anybody and everybody in the West, specifically where we all sit now, Europe, we're the new West, America. We're the, the dumber West, the young, dumber, more rebellious, less refined West. You guys here sitting in places like Sweden are the advanced, old, longstanding imperial West. So Saeed was writing more to you than to me, but he talks about the distinctions between European and American Orientalism as well, which I'm happy to address in my talk. But when I was a young man growing up in Detroit, one of the, uh, I wasn't a good reader, Hussein, don't get mad at me because I know you're a reader. <laughs> but when I was young, I wasn't a good reader. I was a knucklehead. I liked sports and I liked to fight on the streets with my friends. Um, but one of the books that really spoke to me when I was young was Edward Said's autobiography called Out of Place. It's his memoir, right? And he begins that book with writing, I am an Oriental, writing back at the Orientalists who for so long have thrived upon our silence. And when I read those words, it was one of the first things that I read that really spoke to me, right? I didn't know at that juncture, at, I was 16, I believe, what Orientalism meant, right? And if you, if many of us have read Orientalism, you don't know, you can't even understand Orientalism. I'm sorry. <clears throat> even after reading it for 10 times, right? It's, it's dense, difficult, complex book. But I knew the essence in the spirit of what Saeed was talking about, right? He looked like me. He was Arab. He was Palestinian. He was Christian, right? But that didn't matter. In many respects, it's ironic that the most emphatic, the most powerful speaker of Orientalism slash Islamophobia was in fact a Palestinian Christian. But what he meant in the essence of this quote was that everybody and anybody, right, in the Occident, the quote unquote West, right, who was invested in the production and the reproduction in the construction, right, and this is where critical race theory is relevant because we all know critical race theory focuses in on how race and even religious identity is a political construction, was being assembled and engineered not by people who look like you and I, Hussein, right? Not people named Khalid or Khalil or Zainab, right? Or Lutfi or Khadija, right? It was oftentimes white men from European countries, right? Who were the quote unquote Islamic and Middle East experts who were by no means objective and neutral, right? They had a vested interest in demonizing and vilifying individuals who are called Orientals Oriental obviously is an ambiguous and sloppy term, which encompasses a wide range uh, of peoples. We know that the Arab world, the Muslim world, the Middle East, whatever it is you want to call it, is not monolithic on any one line. But that's what Orientalism did. It flattened and homogenized an entire eclectic tapestry of people into one undistinguishable monolith, again, constructed from the vantage point of the West. So it is this master discourse of Islamophobia, which I, you know, I examined really closely as, as an undergraduate, independently through my research, again in law school in the post 9-11 context, where I realized that these tropes that are rising back to the fore, that are re-emerging, that are crafting new stereotypes and misnarratives about who Muslims were, right, was already deeply seated in the imagination of European countries American society, and globally speaking. So when we think about Islamophobia, which I'll deconstruct from an academic and theoretical standpoint now, right? it's important to undergird this conversation with understanding of what, Islam, what Orientalism is, right? because that's the epistemological foundation for um, Islamophobia. How, 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 how am I in time so far? Okay, can you give me like signs? Okay, yeah. Okay, good. So, again, 2013 comes around. In the United States, um, we had a range of political currents taking place at that time. 
2010, before the rise of, you know, a specific orange skin politician who wasn't really being considered as a viable presidential candidate at that juncture, we had a party called the Tea Party. Anybody knows who the Tea Party are? Anybody, does anybody study American modern politics? Okay, good. It's good that you guys, it's good that you don't. <laughs> You're a lot better off for not doing so. <coughs> I'm sick. I apologize if I, if I cough. So the Tea Party came to power in 2010, and the Tea Party were this sort of, how, how do I say this? I know you, you Swedes are a lot more um, formal than us Americans. We can be rough. But the Tea Party were this sort of professionalized, informal political party that were a deviant aberration of the Republican Party, right? They were populists. Their entire message was premised on the idea that America is a white Protestant nation. So the populism you see now in, in Sweden with the Sweden Democrats, obviously ravaging and ripping through places like France for a long time, and across the world was spearheaded by this movement called the Tea Party in 2010, which gave rise to Islamophobia. Interestingly enough, right, for the decade before, because we know that the war on terror began, which year? Which year did the, Ameri did the American war on terror and the global war on terror begin? 01. So from this point of 01 to 2010, right? Hate crimes, hate incidents, Muslim Americans, Masajid. Globally speaking, Muslims are being demonized. Nobody cared about Muslims in the United States. It was okay. It was okay to demonize, to violate, to condemn, to relegate, to subordinate Muslims for this 10-year period until the Tea Party comes to power and champions Islamophobia as one of their full-fledged campaign issues, right? In the same way that our friends, the Sweden Democrats, do here locally in the same way that the uh, Party National, the National, uh, they always change their name, Le Pen's outfit in France does, and obviously most famously in the United States, Trump, right? So people, academics, began to talk about Islamophobia in a very serious way in 2010 in the United States. Discussion about Islamophobia was far already well underway in places like the UK, right? In the UK, there were organizations like Runny Me Trust, which had a definition of Islamophobia in 1993, um, a definition I don't like, to be frank with you, and I'll discuss that in a bit as to why. But there were a range of definitions as to what Islamophobia was in the lay context, in the academic discourses. Um, and as a consequence of Islamophobia becoming an, a, a term and a concept and an issue that was being reckoned with in a robust way in the media and, again, the academic uh, parlances beginning in 2010 as a consequence of the political um, landscape changing, people started talking about it, and the definitions uh, that were being advanced about what Islamophobia was were narrow, limited, and from my vantage point, here, here are some examples that I put on the slide. I won't read them, right? But you can tell they were short-sighted, and for me, given that I'm a law, I was at this juncture, I was a practicing lawyer, right? Um, I, I realized that these definitions that many academics and that many uh, news media outlets, pundits, politicians were adopting were problematic in a range of ways, specifically because they disconnected any and every definition of Islamophobia from the behavior of the state. They were not accounting for the fact that Islamophobia fundamentally is state action, laws, policies, executive orders, legislation, you know, presidential, uh, official, uh, governmental rhetoric. So as a consequence of my dissatisfaction with these definitions of Islamophobia. I wrote an article in 2024, I'm old now, I, the years kind of like blur together. 20, 2014 in the Columbia Law Review, uh, University of Columbia uh, called Islamophobia a new definition in legal framework. It's an academic article that in many respects is the fountainhead, right? It spurred much of the public and academic work that I had written since, right? And in this article, it's a shorter article, I advance a new definition of Islamophobia, right? The definition that I advance, and I've since tweaked this, and I'll, I'll talk about recent tweaks that I've, ma I, I've made with this definition. This is the foundational definition that I advance of Islamophobia in my work. I recently wrote an article in the California Law Review with a political scientist by the name of Nura Siddiqui thinking about Islamophobia as a gendered project, right? So I'm happy to talk about the gender dimensions of Islamophobia that we built upon this foundational definition. But this is my foundational definition of Islamophobia. The definition that I propose is 
Islamophobia is the presumption that Islam is inherently violent, alien, and inassimilable, driven by the belief that Islamic identity or expressions of Islam or Muslim identity are tied to terrorism, right? This is in the post 9-11 war on terror context, right? This is the foundational definition that I advance. And I deconstruct this definition into three slivers in my work, right? One dimension of Islamophobia is private, what I call private Islamophobia. Again, and I'll talk about and articulate what that means in a bit. Uh, the second, and again, most salient or seminal component of Islamophobia is structural Islamophobia. And then finally, Islamophobia as a dialectic, an ongoing, fluid, agile, adaptive communique between the state, right, structural Islamophobia, state-sponsored Islamophobia, and the polity. Right, one of the central tenets, and again, I'm a critical race theorist. For those who don't like critical race theory, feel free to throw tomatoes at me, um, or, or slippers, but I'm like Bush. I can, I can probably dodge a couple. <laughs> maybe not, maybe not today because I'm sick. But um, one of the central tenets of critical race theory is that race is a political construction, right? But it's not a fixed political construction. That all race at large is a broader phenomenon, but racial classifications, right, shift, dynamically shift, they, they fluidly shift in line with changing political, economic, and geopolitical currents. And this broader dialectic of Islamophobia is perpetually tweaking, changing, adapting what Muslim identity looks like from the imagination of the state and society. And that is my, I would say that if you talk to like other critical race theorists in the United States, you know, people like my mentor, Kimberly Crenshaw, who wrote the foreword for this book, she will tell you that this is kind of like one of the primary contributions of my work, right? That uh, introducing this concept of, of dialectical Islamophobia into academic discourses uh, is how critical race theory merges with my theorizing of Islamophobia. Again, tied really intricately to, Islam, to Orientalism as a master discourse is how... I think about Islamophobia, again, being centered and constructed from the specific lens and prism of um, the West. And the West is a problematic term, and again, but I'm using it for purposes of academic and discursive uh, brevity right now, right? And Islamophobia is also a Western project, right? It's intended to do two things. Not only, and again, another critique I have the de of, of the prevailing definitions of Islamophobia. So if I were to ask you, how, how would you, b before hearing all this nonsense that I'm sharing today. If I were to ask you for the definition of Islamophobia, what would you tell me? That Islam is inherently, like, it's, it's a violent religion, and anyone who looks like us or Muslims mm. is a terrorist. Okay. Yeah. How about how about you? Yeah, what's, what, give me, like, a brief definition of what you think it is. Would you say it's it's rational prejudice or irrational prejudice? Irrational. Okay, good. Why, tell me tell me why you think it's rational. You could probably give, come give my presentation if you want. <laughs> <laughs> tell me why. So tell me why do you say rational? Uh, it's, I mean, I see a lot on social media that some people um, maybe like mostly white people will say, "Oh, Islamophobia is not true." Okay, it's just true. yeah. Uh -huh. Because we have seen it on media, in real life, in this world. Mm -hmm. But for them to like to go against it and say, oh, there's no shit going on, or yeah. that's why I say that it's, it's actually rational because um, it's just me saying, like, well, it's not making much sense. Both definitions are excellent, right? But I'm really excited that you said rational. Because most prevailing definitions of Islamophobia would were, were, were probably define it as irrational fear or bigotry of Muslims. Irrational, right? Irrational. It's tied. One thing I hate is when they say Islamophobia is fueled by ignorance, right? That's not true. Ignorance means that you lack knowledge, right? And it's the exact opposite with Western media, academic, political institutions are producing misknowledge, 
miseducating, right? This entire corpus and body of myths, lies, misrepresentations about what Islam is. So it's not ignorance. It's not a rational bigotry. It's rational, specifically when advanced by the state. The state, right, and I say that broadly, not specifically one state, but I, I guess focusing in my head maybe more intimately in this context to the American government, because again, they're the architects and the primary peddlers of Islamophobia uh, as a war on terror sort of outcome. But the reason it's rational is because Islamophobia as um, a, it's a vehicle that enables the state, but also societal actors to advance, to, to vilify Muslims in the religion of Islam, to have access and to facilitate access to a range of political, economic, and geopolitical incentives, right? It's an imperial project in many respects, right? I'll give you an example, right? So the United States, after it launches a conventional war on Afghanistan, right, based on the theory that the Taliban are uh, giving safe harbor to ISIS, then says, hey, this, this ain't enough. You know, us Americans, we like to have multiple fights. I want to punch him on this side, but also punch him on this side. We need to go to, we got to go to war with Iraq. Right? It's funny, like when I, if you're, most Americans can't distinguish Iraq from Iran. We're very dumb people, sadly. <laughs> um, but so they want to go to war in Iraq, right? And if anybody knows anything about the modern history of Iraq, you know that Saddam Hussein was part of the Ba'ath Party. The Ba'ath Party were a secular pan Arab organization that, in many respects, cracked down and criminalized. Islamic movements in their own country. However, because not only Amer especially Americans, but globally speaking, people couldn't make that distinction as a consequence of this long-standing culture of Orientalism and this new novel strand of Islamophobia that enables an easy sell for governments like the United States to say, these guys in Iraq are the same as these bad guys in Afghanistan. Look at Saddam Hussein, he got a mustache, he's got a big old beard, like our friends in Afghanistan, but he's brown, Arab, Afghan, doesn't make, doesn't matter, right? Secular, Arab, religious movements, Taliban, right? And the big secret here is, who funded the embryonic organization that devolved into the Taliban? Anybody know? They were called the Mujahideen. Exactly. And the U.S. backed Saddam Hussein in the 80s yeah. to engage in war with Iran and then funded Iran behind closed doors, right? Mafia tactics. So, there, you know, getting back to rationalism, right? A rash, Islamophobia is rational because as a consequence of demonizing the Iraqi people and being able to stage and legitimize a more than decades-long illegal and baseless war right? The objective was rational utilitarian access to resources in that country, specifically oil, right? So Islamophobia as a state-sponsored project is acutely rational, right? It's intended to demonize a people as a vehicle to accessing a whole range of economic, again, incentives, political benefit in this respect to expand the American sphere of influence through a modern divide and conquer strategy. We oftentimes think about colonialism and imperialism as a bygone sort of arcane project. I'll tell you otherwise. I think it's sort of like mutated and become something, something dramatically different. That is structural Islamophobia. So in the United States, right before the war on terror, we had something called the war on drugs, right? which kind of functioned analogously where we demonized black communities, specifically black men, right? As being these, new, these uh, Hillary Clinton called them super villains, right? They're trotting around American cities like Los Angeles, New York, my home city of Detroit, selling and using drugs and destroying communities. This construction of racialized threat. So even though Islam is obviously a bona fide full-fledged, legitimate religion, it's also racialized as a consequence of Islamophobia to carry out the rational objectives of the state. Islamophobia is also a private phenomenon, right? It's also advanced by hate mongers, 
bigots, vigilantes, right? Specifically during moments of crisis, right? We can, we can think about the rise of the Sweden Democrats as a moment of crisis where their rhetoric, right? Their policy proposals, right? Their momentum is emboldening lay citizens on the ground to want to partake in this project of policing, punishing, and persecuting Muslims, right? And we see this through the rise of hate crimes, hate incidents, right? A mainstreaming of political rhetoric, political discourse that I'm learning maybe maybe years ago and decades ago would be viewed to be bigoted now is politically mainstream. It's okay to call Muslims immigrants, individuals that can never be assimilated into Sweden as a sort of pillar of society that needs to be disciplined, assimilated, or else exported, right? So it's private in the way it's carried out by societal actors. Again, it's also an ongoing communique, discourse, dialectic between the state and society. One central cornerstone, a central cornerstone of every structural Islamophobic policy, we're good on time? Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop in about five minutes because I'm really interested in the conversation with the audience and with, with Hussein. Uh, ongoing conversation and discourse, right, between the state and society. Every state policy uh, that is Islamophobic in nature, we could talk about, you know, framing a bit more closely during the Q&A, is premised on this baseline, right? Baseline idea that expressions of Muslim identity somehow give rise to suspicion or a specter of terrorism. That is a central baseline of every uh, law policy action that we consider to be Islamophobic, right? So if the state, if the state by way of law and policy is based on this, uh, you know, baseline idea that expressions of Muslim identity are somehow tethered to terrorism, it's communicating to members in society that it's okay to discriminate against Muslims, that it's okay to profile Muslims, that it's okay, right? to consider Muslims as outside or othered of societies like Sweden. And that's why I, I, I say quite, omin, quite uh, openly, I think Islamophobia is one of the final bastions of acceptable bigotry as a consequence of laws and policies that are premised on baselines like this. Not only will you be, I think we talked about this last night, Hussein, uh, you will not only, if, if you say something that is homophobic, immediate redress and punishment. Say something that is anti-Semitic, redress and punishment. I'm very vocal about my pro-Palestinian thoughts and, and views in the United States, right? United States is an extremely Zionist society, right? Me saying something pro-Palestinian is oftentimes distorted as being anti-Semitic. And I've gotten, let me tell you this, I, I've sat in interviews where I knew I wasn't going to get the job at a specific law school because I'm actually, I, I don't have to say anything. My mere existence as an Arab Muslim male is read to be anti-Semitic, right? Um... However, if you say something Islamophobic, you ain't gonna get punished, you ain't gonna get redressed, you might become president of the United States, right? So there's reward waiting for you if you engage in Islamophobia by way of economic and specifically political value in this day and age. We see that in, um, you know, again, folds, right? We see that in a range of ways, not only in the United States with the emergence of Trump, who again may become our next president, but obviously in what's happening in Sweden, what's happening in France. And this rise of Islamophobia as a transnational global phenomenon is what motivated me to write this book, is we saw the language, the discourse, the theory, right? The epistemology of Islamophobia, you know, not only sort of, I would say, not only advancing on a global level, but in many respects dictating foreign and political policy, globally speaking, but specifically in the West, not exclusively in the West because as I talk about in my book, we see what's happening with Islamophobia beyond uh, Western context in places like China, India, Myanmar, uh, Muslim majority countries as well. Because I'm, I'm half Egyptian. That government has cracked down considerably on Muslim movements on under the sort of specter of secularism. Same in places like Tunisia, uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa, Canada, in the province of Quebec that passed a copycat uh, headscarf ban in that province in 2019. Uh, Bolsonaro, who was obviously the head of, of, of Brazil, capitalized on Islamophobia as a political tactic. So it's a global uh, phenomenon in many respects. And again, that's what motivated me to shift my attention from Islamophobia as an American domestic sort of enterprise 
and to think about it more critically as to how it's unfolding on a global level. So, um, yeah, and I have like various vignettes about um, Islamophobia as a global level. But let, let me stop there because I've spoken for a long time and I'm really excited to hear uh, questions from the audience. Thank you so much.